So hello everyone and welcome to our next Manta Talks. Uh, today we will discuss the new privacy regulations such as CDPA, CPRA and CPA. Ali will tell you just in a minute what this all means. At this webinar, you will learn more about the new privacy laws in the United States, the differences and similarities between them, and what are your obligations and what can you do now to be sure your organization is compliant when they come to effect. Uh, our speakers today is Ali A. Jasani, privacy and cybersecurity lawyer at Wilmerhale, and Ernie Ostick, Senior Vice President of Products at Manta. This is all for the introduction. Uh, I just want to say that if you have any questions to the speakers or you want to clarify anything, please use the chat uh, that you can see on the site and we will try to answer all your questions at the end. And that's it for me. I will hand it over to Ali. Thank you, Carolina. So as you mentioned, our presentation today is on the new state privacy laws that have passed recently within the last year in the United States. Um, and we are gonna touch upon an overview of those laws. We'll go over the key similarities and key differences. Uh, we'll touch on an overview of potential compliance steps and then Ernie will talk about how Manta can help with those compliance steps. So to get started, an overview of the CPRA, CDPA and the CPA. So the CPRA refers to the California Privacy Rights Act, which was passed by a ballot initiative in November of 2020. It builds upon the existing CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, most of the provisions go into effect January 1st, 2023. Um, and as we'll discuss earlier, it adds a number of provisions to the CCPA um, and it adds a level of, an additional level of detail. It, most of the law brings this California law more in line with the EU's GDPR, but there are some uh, differences there as well that we'll touch upon. Next is Virginia's Consumer Data Protection Act. It was voted into law in February of 2021, and it also goes into effect on January 1st, 2023. This was the second comprehensive privacy law passed in the United States at the state level. Um, and, uh, you know, there has been, as we'll talk about, there's been, a num there's been a big movement at the state level, especially since the CCPA passed to get a state, for states to follow that model. Washington has tried numerous times as has New York and a number of other states, but Virginia actually managed to do so and became the second state to pass a comprehensive privacy law. And then shortly thereafter, um, Colorado joined Virginia and California. It voted at the Colorado Privacy Act into law in June of 2021. And most of the provisions of that law go into effect July 1st, 2023. So key similarities between all three of these laws, they all apply to businesses that process the personal information or personal data of residents within the state and meet certain revenue or data collection thr thresholds. So um, for, for the CCPA currently, for example, businesses have to have an annual revenue threshold of over 25 million or process the personal data of over 50,000 California residents. And each of these, um, and, and both the CDPA and CPA have similar, albeit different data processing thresholds that if you meet the threshold for the number of residents in those states, then those laws apply to you. But there are a number of key exemptions in each of these laws. So for example, nonprofits and all of these laws are exempt from the scope, um, which is different than say the GDPR, for example. Um, and then both the, uh, the CDPA and the CPA exempt certain entities regulated under federal law. So the CDPA, for example, reg uh, exempts uh, enti business associates and covered entities um, under HIPAA, as well as financial institutions under HIPAA. And the CPA exempts financial institutions under the G uh, sorry, financial institutions under the GLBA, as does the CDPA. So the California law doesn't have an, these entity-wide exemptions. It does exempt data regulated by the GLBA and HIPAA, but the CDPA have these entity-wide exemptions, which um, make them a little bit broader in terms of the data that they exclude from the scope of the laws. Um, and then another key similarity is covered information. So traditionally in the US, we've regulated privacy using a sector specific approach. So we have the GLBA for financial institutions and financial data, HIPAA for covered entities and protected health information. These laws are tending to apply to, a, they include a broad definition of personal information or personal data as 
any information that relates to an identifiable individual, but they still have a number of key exclusions that are relevant to businesses. So for example, they exclude the identified information and they define this concept differently in each of these laws. They exclude publicly available information and similarly they define this concept differently. They exclude business to business and employee information in some capacity. And notably the California Privacy Rights Act only does this until January 1st, 2023, at which point, unless the California legislature passes um, an extension, B2B and employee information will be regulated under that law as well. Um, they also, as I mentioned earlier, they exclude information regulated under certain federal laws. So PHI under HIPAA is excluded, information regulated under the Graham Lynch Bliley Act or Fair Credit Reporting Act is excluded, as well as a number of other federal privacy laws like the Drivers Privacy Protection Act and others. Um, and they all create special processing obligations for sensitive data. And they all define this concept somewhat differently. Um, but, you know, it generally includes health information, information about someone's sexual orientation. Um, it, it's similar to the concept um, as it's been uh, included in the GDPR. So other key similarities, they, like the GDPR, all of these laws have some sort of controller or processor distinction. The, the, the CPRA calls it a business service provider distinction. Uh, but basically the primary obligation to comply with the laws is on the controller or the business. And then the processors or service providers are, are generally required to comply with the law based on their contractual relationship with the controller or processor. And this contractual relationship is through a data processing agreement. Um, which And all of these laws require certain provisions to be included in these agreements, and they vary in terms of the specific requirements. All of these laws also have some form of individual rights for consumers, and so this refers to the right of access, a right to deletion, um, a right to um, not a, a notice of initial uh, data collection, and a notice and a right to opt out. The right to opt out for those of you who have paid attention to the CCPA was the most, you know, the most difficult provision for businesses to comply with. And now, in addition to the CCPA slash CPRA having that provision, both the Virginia law and the Colorado law also have this a right to opt out provision. And theirs is slightly broader in the sense that it doesn't just apply to sale, it applies to targeted advertising, it applies to profiling. And that in the case of the Virginia law, it also applies to, um, children, the processing of children's data. Um, all of these laws have notice obligations. So in, the, in that sense, they all require updates to um, businesses' privacy policies. And, you know, there's, a, there's an overlap in terms of the information that may be excluded, but there are still slight differences between these laws in terms of what they require in a business's privacy policy. They all include uh, some sort of privacy by design provisions. And what I mean by that are provisions aimed at um, limiting at limiting the data that a business collects in the first instance. And so this means like data minimization, um, implementing reasonable security safeguards, um, purpose limitation, as in limiting the use of data for the purpose for which it was collected and not um, avoiding the avoiding using data for secondary purposes. And so, you know, this is these are um, all of these laws have some sort of privacy by design provisions, at least to some extent. Um, they all regulate targeted advertising, at least in some capacity. And this is becoming this is this is tending to be a focus of privacy laws. And it's you know, it's tending to dominate a lot of the privacy debate um, because it's, um, it's it's something that, it, that that regulators are paying more attention to that. You know, it's becoming more popular in the news with the the, the changes that are happening with third party cookies and, and otherwise. And then all of these laws have some form of AG enforcement. So the California AG um, currently can enforce the CCPA, though that will change with, um, you know, the California Privacy Protection Agency coming into place. Um, the Virginia AG can enforce the, the Virginia law and the Colorado AG can enforce the Colorado law, but so can district attorneys in Colorado. So that one's a little bit more expanded. Um, moving on to key differences. So the CPRA is... It, the, the California Privacy Rights Act is significantly different than both the Colorado law and the Virginia law, and it's because it's building upon an existing framework. Um, the CCPA, for those of you who know, have, has an interesting history. It was, it was also proposed as a ballot initiative, but then the California legislature quickly passed it to avoid the ballot initiative. 
Um, but, you know, the, the sponsor of the bill didn't feel like it was adequate. And so the CPRA, he proposed the CPRA and that passed by ballot initiative. So because of its interesting history, it has different provisions than the other laws do. Um, and one of the key difference, one of the key differences is that it has a limited private right of action for security incidents. Now, uh, I mean, it's, it's an interesting provision because it doesn't apply to privacy provisions. You don't have a, a private right of action if someone you know, doesn't properly give you your right to delete, for example. But you do if your data was um, subject to unauthorized access as, as a result of a business failing to take into account reasonable security measures. And so that's an, that's an interesting provision that the, the CPRA has. Another one that I mentioned earlier is that it creates a new enforcement agency, the California Privacy Protection Agency. The other laws um, enforce their uh, in, are enforceable through existing mechanisms, such as the AG's office. But here, the, the new enforcement agency is going to be responsible for enforcing and, and c conducting rulemaking under the law. Um, it doesn't have any entity-wide exemptions for HIPAA or GLPA. This is also important because um, the, the entity-wide exemptions are broad, right? They, they, to the extent that any to the extent that you are a business associate in some capacity under HIPAA, you may be excluded from the Virginia law altogether. But here, like the, the California law exempts information that is covered by, by uh, HIPAA or the GLBA. So to the extent that you process both HIPAA covered information and information that falls outside of HIPAA, you are still liable or responsible for complying with the CPRA for information that is that falls outside of HIPAA. So um, it's another way in which these laws are different in terms of what they require businesses to consider. Uh, there are special obligations for protecting children's personal information. This goes beyond COPPA. Um, the, the CPRA has a special obligation for processing the personal information of children's ages 13 to 16. So it, uh, it focuses on like filling in the gaps where COPPA, where COPPA doesn't address um, certain uh, obligations on businesses. Uh, it requires special website obligations. This is, again, different. So, the, for example, the CCP already has a do not sell my personal information requirement that businesses are required to implement on their websites. Um, the CPRA is going to expand upon that and, and require a similar label for sensitive personal information, saying limit, limit the use of my sensitive personal information. Um, and it's, it's likely that all of this will be expanded upon in rulemaking by the, C, by the California Privacy Protection Agency. Um, there's no consent requirement for sensitive data, similar to the other laws, um, but there is a there is an opt out and it's a and there's a limitation on use um, in the first instance. And the look back period for the CPRA begins January 1st, 2022. So most of the law, most of the law applies to information that businesses process after January 1st, 2022, though the right to know provision goes beyond that. Um, but other than that, the most of the law applies to information after January 1st, 2022. And then with the CDPA, one of the key differences, there's no rulemaking authority for the attorney general in Virginia. So that's that's interesting because, you know, we've at least in the CCPA, we've seen the attorney general or, you know, uh, another agency add more detail to some of the specific provisions through rulemaking. There is no authority for that for the Virginia AG under the CDPA. So we'll see if the, if the Virginia legislature changes that or does its own um, sort of specificities to the law uh, in, in, in the forthcoming sessions. And then there's no special provisions for a universal opt-out mechanism. So one of the things that the CPRA does and the Colorado law does is that it, it, it envisions a scenario where a, a consumer is using an opt-out tool to indicate to a business uh, through a web browser or something to indicate to a business that it doesn't want its information to be sold or its information to be used for profiling or um, for targeted advertising. The CDPA doesn't discuss that concept, but both the CPRA and the CPA do. So that's an interesting difference. Um, and, and in terms of the CPA, there is a referendum in, there is the potential for a referendum in the CPA that allows for the law not to go into effect. And so we'll find out next year if Colorado residents um, you know, don't want the CPA to go into effect and they have a referendum and they vote against it. I, I don't think that it's a, a huge possibility, but it, it, the, the law does allow for this. Um, there, there's a right to cure provision in the Colorado law as there is in the, in the California privacy law, um, but that expires on January 1st, 2025. So that's a bit different because California's right to cure law, cure provision exists as part of the enforcement mechanism. Businesses can show that they have fixed the alleged violation of the law and therefore not be held liable. 
the Colorado privacy law has a right to cure, but then after January 1st, 2025, it doesn't anymore. And so that, that'll be an interesting um, uh, process for businesses to navigate. And it doesn't create special separate penalty amounts. The CCPA and the CDPA have special penalty provisions under their laws. It's enforceable as a de deceptive trade practice under Colorado law. So that's a bit of a distinction in terms of how we're seeing these laws being enforced, where the other laws have set statutory damages. Uh, but the Colorado law doesn't. It's enforceable as a deceptive trade practice. So what does this mean for compliance? The, the key the key to any privacy law compliance is data mapping. And Ernie will you know, touch on that a little bit more. Uh, but it's understanding where your data is, where it comes from, um, and, you know, where and where the consumers whose data you process are located, because that's what ultimately governs your compliance obligations. And then, you know, related is understanding where all of your obligations are, right? If you're processing Colorado residents' data, understanding the obligations under that law, same with California and Virginia. And then implementing privacy by design principles wherever applicable. We're seeing more and more laws implement these principles, whether it's data minimization, purpose limitation. This tends, this is tending to be a trend of privacy laws going forward. And so this is something that all businesses should be looking at. As and the same goes for reasonable security measures. Um, you know, especially in relation to the California law, where businesses can be sued um, through a private right of action uh, for failing to do so. Uh, and then documenting your compliance, right? Uh, no, having the proper pa paperwork in place in terms of privacy policies, consent forms, data processing agreements, um, data protection impact assessment, things like that, making sure that you're checking the right boxes to assist with your privacy compliance. And with that, I'll pass it on to Ernie to discuss how Manta can help with that. Thank you, Ali, that was great. Um, so let's talk about implementing data lineage for governance and regulatory compliance, and specifically uh, for compliance with these new laws that we're just seeing everywhere. So let's start by just kind of level setting for all of us that are in this discussion on what do we mean by data lineage? So what is data lineage? And it, it's the ability to track how data is flowing through your enterprise. Where does it come from? What are all the different sources? Where does it go to? Obviously, we know it probably goes to a data warehouse and maybe some decision support locations and places where you do accounts receivable and payable, and it may go to um, you know, Excel spreadsheets and things. But there's also sometimes places where it's gone from legacy applications that created audit trails, debugging files that may still exist. And, you know, these are places where potentially there could be liabilities because you may be putting privacy data in places you never even anticipated. But also part of lineage is understanding what happens to data while it's on its journey. How is it transformed? How is it reshaped and aggregated so that it can be more useful as an asset within your organization? And so data lineage is about all of these things. Where did it come from? Where does it go to? How was it transformed, changed, or edited uh, while it's in its journey? But lineage can be difficult to achieve. And these are obstacles that need to be overcome if you're going to meet these compliance regulations, understand uh, what they are and where your potential risks and liabilities are and it can be complicated for a lot of different uh, reasons depending upon your organization uh, one of these is a level of detail and what's necessary from a business user perspective versus a technical perspective and it depends on what you're trying to analyze if we're trying to actually technically look at where does this data come from that's that's sitting on our web page uh, or how do we actually process it before it gets there? Um, you know, that may be a very low level technical view. If we look at it from a business perspective, it might just be trying to get a better understanding of how is that information uh, being moved around, uh, even if we fully understand that a particular source system definitely has the number of customers in it that's going to put us over the threshold. But I need to conceptually see where else am I sending it to? Um, the rate of change is important. Code changes all the time, as we're going to talk about just uh, towards the end of this on what Manta provides in terms of analyzing your code. That's how we do it. We look at code and code changes. Uh, there are ETL tools that are put in place that make edits and changes in order to uh, affect 
uh, a new report that's needed next week and, and get the data into your analytic system. And companies evolve. Uh, this is where sometimes hidden risks can exist. Uh, you've done acquisitions and mergers. Uh, those mergers and acquisitions have many different tools, many different systems. And maybe there's certain shared customer resources across them, but they're flowing in, in different ways. And perhaps they've all come together in one place, uh, but definitely in the short term, you may just be using both systems at the same time or many more than that. Uh, and you're dealing not only with uh, different locations of data, but you're also dealing with different skill sets and, and different you know, legacy tribal knowledge of where such data exists and uh, it's hard sometimes in mergers and acquisitions for all of that to come together. And finally, people migration. Uh, people move on. Uh, people get promoted, people retire, people uh, move on to different projects. And so the subject matter experts that used to know how that data flows or where it comes from may not uh, be immediately accessible or not available to you uh, any longer. So there's several clear use cases for lineage. Uh, the ones that we see most often from our customers include data ops, which is all about uh, debugging your data pipelines and keeping them reliable uh, if they break, or you know, for instance, a DBA uh, or an architect that wants to make a change to a stored procedure, wants to see exactly what's the impact of things happening downstream. Uh, and cloud migrations, especially moving legacy databases up to a cloud implementation, trying to get a full inventory on what it is that you actually have in that application before you move every single asset up to the cloud. Perhaps there's reports you're not using or views that were never used because you purchased a decision support model at that particular point in time. No point in moving everything. Lineage can help you get an in inventory of that. Uh, data quality is uh, where we start to get moving into um, areas of trust as well as a regulatory compliance and looking within the context of lineage, where might you have data quality issues that you should address? Data quality issues exist everywhere, um, but look at them within the context of lineage and you can help determine that a report that's affected by a data quality problem and that report goes to your financial uh, officer every single week, yeah, that might be a more important one than another one that you know is a data quality issue that happens to affect you know parking passes for your employees. Ah, that's important too. But if you can look at them within a lineage context, you might be able to pri prioritize those data quality issues even more. But on the regulatory and compliance issue, it's about understanding that data map that Ali talked about and then being able to flag the risks that you have and document the lineage so that when regulators do come looking closely, you can show them that you have a full, complete understanding of how data flows through your enterprise. So let's look at some of these uh, specifically. Chasing down lineage manually is extremely costly and time consuming. And uh, being able to do this in an automated fashion will let you get the answers to that regulator much, much faster than you would have before or make intelligent decisions about how you should reduce and minimize the risks that you have for data privacy. Um, many, many times lineage becomes part of an overall governance solution. And governance has many components. One of them is data understanding. You'll see governance solutions on the market that do lots with business glossaries and stewardship and making sure that you've got the right people assigned who are in the know about certain data. And data quality becomes a key component and understanding the profiling of the information that you have. And often the data quality piece will blossom to understanding exactly where you have privacy data that you didn't think that you did. Right? And there's solutions out there for that. But governance is like a three-legged stool. And you can have those two components, but if you don't have the third one, which is lineage, then the stool is going to be unstable. So you need to have that complete. And so having lineage that will interface with the governance solution that you've chosen is extremely critical. Being able to highlight these data quality or privacy issues in the context of your pipelines is critical. I mentioned the data quality example before, but it's the same thing when we talk about privacy. So if you 
are aware or some tooling has helped you identify that a particular table in one of your databases contains privacy information, it's going to be important to you now to do lineage on that to see, okay, where does this come from upstream? Which transactional systems do I need to be constant, consciously aware of in order to comply with uh, the meanings or representations and, and rules that I have to follow, uh, whether it comes from a website or from other transactional environment? And I'll use this one to kind of launch over to the final bullet on the page is if I know that it's coming in some database table that I've identified that's PII, where does it go to downstream? Expose unknown sources and targets such as audit trail files and debugging files where we've been dumping customer information, um, perhaps to make it more convenient during debugging, but now I need to be fully aware that that's there. And maybe if I'm modernizing it, and I wrote that system 15 years ago, let's eliminate some of these loose ends that could come back to haunt us later. Um, being able to define the scope of your governance initiatives is important. Uh, when you find out that you've got uh, a particular report that's extremely critical, it is going to go out to a regulator. What is the lineage for that? And maybe that's where you're going to focus your attention initially. Uh, a lot of times governance efforts will try to grab the whole ocean of data that you have and it's, it's too much. Where do you start in order to ensure that you have some immediate successes? And overall, the part of governance compliance that becomes critical is to give you overall trust, then you can give your regulators overall trust that you are controlling your data, that you feel confident in it, that you're not going to get fined and you have no loose ends uh, that could be sitting out there uh, to haunt you. So what do we do at Manta? At Manta, as I mentioned earlier, we look at code. We look at your legacy systems, your COBOL code. We look at your SQL uh, stored procedures and statements within your data lakes and your data repositories and data marts. Uh, we go through that in detail and we look at the individual technical statements. For those of you that are familiar with something like SQL, as an example, we look at the inserts and we look at the selects, the where clauses and the columns that are used. We pull out the transformations where possible so they can be surfaced. So you don't have to chase down a developer to figure out exactly how a you know, risk calculation for banking was actually uh, put together and formatted. Or where is that customer name actually coming from and how is it actually built by concatenating different parts of those uh, uh, elements of a name or address uh, and other details about someone. And we document that lineage along the way. So we actually know how it's actually flowing from one piece to another. And then we provide a detailed visualization. Think of it like uh, like a like a map, you know, map software that's going to illustrate how you actually travel from you know one city to another city. Very similar here in that we are diagramming that flow, so you can see not only those endpoints but all the individual places, cities, and highways where that data has traveled uh, will travel as it moves through your environment. And optionally, take that lineage and make it available into a third-party governance solution for those users who are uh, implementing one of those tools. Okay, Carolina. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ernie and Ali, for covering such a broad topic in this limited time. Uh, if there's anyone in the crowd who has a question, now is the right time to put them in the chat. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can read some articles on the topic. Uh, I will put the links in the chat just in a second. And for more information about Manta and its capabilities, you can visit getmanta.com website. And for more information about the privacy laws and governance laws, you can visit uh, wilmerhale.com. Okay, so my first question here is probably on Ali. And it asks, um, what is the chance that there is eventually a federal privacy law passed? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I think with you know more states joining um, California, like Colorado and Virginia, passing their own privacy laws, I think you're going to get a real push from industry to have a uniform standard. And you know, and we've seen some federal privacy proposals already. Uh, it's unclear as to when the exact threshold will be, where to the extent that, you know, there are significant differences between the laws, 
you know, it'll be almost inconsistent for businesses to comply with, with all of these laws simultaneously, but we haven't necessarily reached that point yet. So um, I think that as more and more states pass similar laws to the ones we discussed today, there, there's going to be a real chance for our federal privacy law. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, another question that's here, <clears throat> and that's how does Lineage helps with finding PII, so private identifiable information? It's, yeah. So um, what Manta is doing is being able to highlight the paths that that data will flow once you've identified and are aware of it. Now, many of you are probably fully aware that a particular database, a particular table has personal identifiable information in it uh, and whatever you've determined that that makes sense for, for that. Or you may be using a solution that's uh, available. Uh, we have partners uh, in this space who look at data and they make determinations that you have privacy information that you might not have been aware of, could be hidden in, in, in fields or comment fields or other places that were immediately obvious. Once you've made that identification, and can see it within a lineage path because you've brought that added value metadata into Manta, being able to trace that flow up and down, uh, both downstream and upstream within your enterprise is where Manta can really help. Okay, okay, thank you. Then there's another question. I think that you partially answered it all, but uh, if you have something to add to this, um, will the federal government rep uh, replace the state laws with a federal approach? So, you know, this is one of the open questions on a federal privacy law is the extent to which a federal privacy law would preempt state laws. And this is one of the issues where there is, a, it's a point of contention, right? Um, there are some lawmakers that want states to be able to pass stricter provisions and more, you know, um, uh, that go beyond federal protections. They view federal protections to be a floor. Um, and there are other there are other regulators who are of the impression that um, uniformity is what matters. And so uh, it doesn't make sense to have a patchwork of state laws when you have a federal law. And so they want to preempt the, the state laws. And so it, it, this is a big point. Uh, this is a big point of contention in the federal privacy debate. It's one of the sticking points and it's unclear um, as to how it'll be resolved. But I think I think a federal law will at least have some level of preemption that will preempt state laws to, to some extent. Um, it's unclear if it will completely preempt them, however. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Uh, the next question is, uh, what are audit requirements other than compliance documents? Probably to you, Ali, as well. Um, what are, I mean, the, the requirements vary, right? Like it's, um, you know, I try to touch on some of the high level stuff, but these laws are pretty detailed in terms of what they require. Um, for example, like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the California law requires like um, a certain uh, buttons to be on your website so people can opt out of sharing their information easier. Um, the CCPA already requires training and record keeping requirements. Um, I imagine the Colorado law, because it doesn't have rulemaking for the attorney general, is going to have more detailed provisions um, coming forward before it goes into effect. So the the, the obligations are detailed. There are some overlap between um, what these laws require, but uh, ultimately they require a full compliance assessment. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's I can't just uh, identify all of them and, a 30 second clip so of course thank you uh next question uh how will this affect internal derivate info such as fraud analysis and data science can you comment on this Ali? sorry what was the question uh how will this affect internal derivate info such as fraud analysis and data science yeah, so a lot of these, a lot of these laws have, ex have have notable exemptions, and I mentioned, you know, some of the exemptions related to laws that are to information that is regulated by other laws, but they also have exemptions related to, um, you know, information that a company uses for its internal purposes, such as fraud investigation and um, other and other delineated purposes. So the specific use cases vary, but the laws generally aren't unreasonable in terms of what they require. And they, and they don't prevent, they don't prevent a business from using data in certain ways. They just make sure that 
that when a business does use certain information in certain ways, that it's checking the boxes, right? It's checking the appropriate boxes. And so um, I don't think it's going to affect those use cases necessarily. It's just to make sure that the business isn't also using the information for other purposes that are not permitted or that require additional compliance steps under the laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another one, uh, how can you work with a company that doesn't know its lineage? No, if Ernie, you can comment on this one, it's more technical. How do we work with a company that doesn't know its lineage? Well, you know, I think usually one of the key things is helping people be aware that lineage is even important, um, you know, and the definition of lineage or asking questions about how they, how they are answering concerns that they have. I mean, I, there isn't an executive or even just uh, doesn't have to be an executive, you know, any decision maker at an organization who looks at a spreadsheet, there isn't a time when they're not confused about some piece of it. And they may do lineage today by a myriad of phone calls and emails. Um, and so addressing the fact that that can be solved, that can be automated with visualization, I think is the first, that's the first objective, making them aware that it's even doable and making them aware that they are probably doing it already through old fashioned manual means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question in, is on you, Ernie, as well. And that goes, can Manta actually allow, allow us to show data quality performance, such as results from column over data profiling from DG tools? Very, very good question. Um, it can show it. Right, uh, Manta is focused on analyzing code. However, the information that's either gained from you know your own tribal knowledge and documentation of your internal systems, or that's provided by other vendors who do look specifically at private information, that can be added to Manta. Um, those tools do a fantastic job, but they're pouring through you know billions of rows to figure this stuff out and present it in in uh, whatever way that they're presenting it but being able to put it into a lineage diagram you know imagine that you have a lineage diagram and of course you know we use uh, tools like our monitors and everything else to display it imagine if you had it completely laid out on a giant whiteboard all the way across the wall and for some of you that's necessary because your enterprises are so extensive but if you could lay it out on the wall What's the value of on that lineage diagram and having, you know, bright orange sticky notes attached to whatever particular part of the lineage where you or some other solution has identified a data quality uh, issue that needs to be flagged and needs attention brought to it. And so Manta has methods where you can um, basically ingest into Manta these data quality characteristics or privacy characteristics and then manta when it's displaying the lineage will highlight them for you with whatever color you want uh you know you you can make that determination so that's how um, we're presenting it and working with uh, our customers as well as partners who can feed that information into manta mm -hmm. thank you i hope that answered the question I don't see any more questions, so we answer them all. Thank you both. Uh, I think that it was a great overview from both sides, like from the legal side and then from the technical one. But if anyone has, has further questions, then you can reach out, reach out either to Ali and Ernie through the emails that you see here on, on the slide or just reply to me via the email that I'll send you later on. Uh, thank you all very much and have a great day. Thank you.